Evil Within is a survival horror game that was released a few years ago back in 2014. It was developed by Tango Gameworks and published by Bethesda. And this game was Shinji Mikami's last game as director. I remember the debut trailer for this when the game was announced. There was a lot of people that was looking forward to this game, specifically because Shinji Mikami's name was attached to it. And Shinji Mikami is the creator of Resident Evil, and he directed Resident Evil 1 and Resident Evil 4, which is considered to this day to be the best game in that particular franchise. So a lot of people were really looking forward to this. There was a lot of anticipation surrounding this game before its release. The game turned out to be a great return to survival horror. It wasn't without its faults. There is one big glaring flaw with The Evil Within, which I'll get to. And if I had to compare this to the games in the Resident Evil franchise that Shinji Mikami directed, such as Resident Evil 1 and Resident Evil 4, obviously those games are much stronger than this. But this is not a bad game at all. Um, like I said, this was a great return to classic survival horror because survival horror at that time was basically a dead genre. The Resident Evil franchise at the time had basically abandoned its roots, and a lot of people were thinking that was a permanent thing. Fortunately, it wasn't, but at the time, that's where the franchise was. And Dead Space 3 turned out to be a big disappointment for a lot of people, considering that game turned out to be more action-oriented than its previous two predecessors. And so The Evil Within was a game that came out at the right time that the genre really needed it the most. And first and foremost, the main thing that the game gets right is its atmosphere. The game has the perfect atmosphere for a survival horror game. And it uses a lot of cliche settings, but it does interesting things with those settings, such as the creepy mental hospital or the creepy mansion or the incinerator or the meat hanger in the game's prologue. There's a lot of cliche settings, but as I said, the game does utilize them in the best way possible to create an unsettling atmosphere. And it really does work, especially when you combine the other elements of what makes horror horror. And that's the ambience, the combination of both music and sound design, both of which this game also excels at. Now, the Evil Within gameplay-wise is a third-person shooter from an over-the-shoulder perspective, so very similar to Resident Evil 4. But unlike Resident Evil 4, you can move around while you're aiming, and the camera is a bit closer up on you. So in close quarters combat, the game can become a challenge to engage in the combat in a way where it doesn't feel like you're actually fighting with the game's controls. For the most part, the game takes an emphasis on the player engaging in combat from a mid to long range position when facing enemies in combat. And that also goes the same for the boss fights in the game. And the bosses in this game are done extremely well. From the multi-armed Lara creature that you're forced to flee from, as well as the blood boss and the amalgam creature, the giant mutated dog, so on and so forth. Each and every single boss is a representation of the game's main villain, Ruvik, which I'll talk more about him later. And a lot of the bosses you're forced to actually flee from. So the game treats the boss fights more as these special set pieces, rather than a standard boss fight where you're just supposed to pump the boss with a bunch of ammunition until their health depletes. And that's a very different approach, but it's one that works because the game is a horror game. The best boss in this game is the Keeper, who not only had a great challenge to that particular boss fight, but also when it comes to the atmosphere, that particular boss fight I feel stands above the rest in the game. But there's a lot of great creatures that they came up with for this game. That's the other great part about The Evil Within is that the monster design in this is some of the best that I've seen in any video game, especially for a horror game. Every creature feels like they actually belong in this game's world, and they contrast each other pretty well, and a lot of them are pretty terrifying. Now, when it comes to the normal enemies in the game, getting off of the bosses, they don't offer much of a challenge, but if you raise the difficulty level to normal, you'll find that the game is actually a fair challenge to get through. And one of the main reasons for that is because of the limited number of ammunition that's in the game. 
And even if you do what I did and you play through the game a few times and you unlock all the upgrades, so you upgrade your stamina all the way, you upgrade your health all the way, you upgrade all the weapons all the way, the game will still give you a, a pretty good challenge. And that's not something I can say for most video games that are out there that have some kind of RPG upgrade system that was developed. The shooting in the game feels pretty good. The weapons do have kickback to them, although aiming isn't the best in this game, but it's not the worst either. I would say it's definitely not as good as the over-the-shoulder perspective in the Resident Evil games, which were developed much more efficiently by comparison. But the shooting in the game is good enough to where it doesn't become frustrating, and you can pull off headshots with ease once you get the controls down. One thing I really wish the game developers worked on with this is the melee combat, which is absolutely awful. The only way you ever do any substantial damage with a melee attack in this game is if you grab one of the axes, and you have to find those. It's not a normal item that you can carry around with you. And the only reason it's really effective is because it's a one-hit kill for a lot of the standard enemies that are in the game. So those are some of the strongest aspects of The Evil Within, being its gunplay, its graphical presentation, its horror-based atmosphere, the creature design, and the overall presentation. But here are some of the weaknesses. As I said before, when it comes to the gameplay, close quarters combat can really be a chore in this game, and it can get frustrating really quick depending on the situation. And it can lead to some very cheap one-hit kills from the enemy AI. And this is really an issue with a lot of different survival horror games. The game developers have to balance the game in the right way to where you don't feel like you're too weak, but you also don't want to be overpowered. When it comes to the power scale in a survival horror game, you want to feel like you're the weaker one and the monsters that you fight are the strong ones because because that creates tension in the game and tension is what you want when you're developing a horror based video game and so for the most part they did do that pretty well at least through the first seven chapters of the game honestly from chapters eight through pretty much the rest of the game the game really regresses into a shooting gallery and that's something that Shinji Mikami claimed that he wanted to avoid when he was developing this game. And it's a shame that the game really devolves into that later in the game, specifically around chapters 11 and 12, and some of 13 as well. And during those chapters are some of the moments where ammunition becomes extremely scarce. And so every shot counts, literally. And so placing certain enemies in certain areas and just the overall number of enemies in certain areas in the later half of the game really wasn't a good decision. And I wish the development team would have made some different decisions with how that's handled. Now, ultimately, the biggest problem with The Evil Within is its narrative. So in this game, you play as a police detective, Sebastian Castellanos. At the beginning of the game, Sebastian along with two other rookie detectives, Joseph and Julie, respond to a call at a mental hospital. And when they get there, they discover that there's been a slaughter and it's very gory. Upon further investigation, all three, Julie, Joseph, and Sebastian, find themselves locked inside a dream world of a psychopath who has a tragic backstory. And that villain is Ruvik. And so basically the entire game is about these three characters trying to find a way to escape. And there's some other twists thrown in that really don't make any sense and that aren't really explained, such as Julie Kidman's real motives and what her true objective is in the game, which I felt was just randomly thrown into this game and it didn't really have any payoff because it wasn't really explained. And they did go more into the Julie Kidman character with regards to her story and what was going on with her. However, they did that for the DLC, and that's something that you have to pay extra for outside of the main game. The other characters aren't really interesting, including Sebastian himself. And that's mainly because these characters aren't really fleshed out. And if I were to compare this with, once again, Resident Evil 4, you know, the Leon Kennedy character in that game was a character that we already knew from a previous game, Resident Evil 2. 
And even when Leon was introduced in Resident Evil 2, there was a dual narrative going on between his story and Claire Redfield's story. But in The Evil Within, you play as Sebastian throughout the entire game. And so you really don't get to connect with Julie that much in the game or Joseph that much in the game. And they just randomly appear as AI partners for specific areas in the game only. And they offered some interesting gameplay moments throughout the game, but narratively, they just were not interesting characters. And the same goes with Ruvik. Ruvik's backstory is explained specifically in Chapter 9, and you find out what really happened to him, as well as his big sister and his parents. But pretty much his entire backstory is told through flashbacks, which is the other main issue with the game's narrative, is that most of it is told through flashback sequences. So you're really experiencing the story secondhand, and it just feels like the game, narratively speaking, is more of a passive experience, because you're learning about events that already took place so many years prior to the game's events, instead of just playing the game and enjoying what's happening in, in the present. The game spends so much time focused on what happened in the past, and that's just not a compelling narrative. And there's certain parts about the story that can really get confusing and it just becomes convoluted the more the game goes on so the story is definitely the weakest part about the evil within and of course you do have some issues mechanically such as the clunky nature of how Sebastian moves can easily become frustrating in certain sections of the game but as I stated before that's just part of the survival horror genre in general and I don't find it that big of an issue to completely knock the game. I know one major issue a lot of people had with this game is the letterbox visual style. When you're playing the game, the widescreen letterbox style that you see in movies is on by default. And I believe they patched it out to where you can play the game full screen. But a lot of people really weren't happy with this because the presentation of the game didn't feel their television screens I suppose and I can see why that would bother some people for me that didn't really bother me because when I was playing the game my eyes were fixated not on the letterbox but on the game itself in certain areas in the environment or whatever the case was throughout the entire playthrough and so the letterbox style didn't really bother me while the game's story is very disappointing for the evil within I'm glad that the ending does feel conclusive, and if they didn't want to make a sequel to this game, for the most part, the way the game ended is pretty satisfying, and it doesn't really leave anything open for a sequel. And so the game feels very conclusive and satisfying by the time you reach the end of it. Ultimately, I'm really glad that this game came out, and Shinji Mikami decided to make one more game before stepping down from the role of being a games director. And the concept of the game was strong enough and flexible enough that they did leave some aspects of the story open to where if they wanted to make a sequel, they could. But if they didn't, the game still would have felt like it had a satisfying ending. And eventually, Tango Gameworks did decide to go ahead and make a sequel to The Evil Within, which I would like to do a retrospective on The Evil Within 2 at some point. But for now, this was definitely a great game. And like I said, this came out at the right time that it really was needed and while the game isn't perfect it was just the right game that the genre really needed at the time this game came out also this game was received pretty well some of the reviews were mixed some were lower than others but ultimately the game was received pretty well and the critics did give this game praising reviews so that's my retrospective for the evil within it's the game that truly saved survival horror at the time the genre needed it the most